I want you to turn with me over in the book of Luke. Luke chapter number 6. Very interesting scripture that I've taken, and they'll get my monitors there in just a second. They're really a little bit loud, Jody. Luke chapter number 6. As we get started this evening, I want to just uh, throw something out there for you. There was a lot of questions surrounding Jesus when Jesus was born. There's a lot of questions about Mary and Joseph. We talked about that Sunday just a little bit. Not only then, but there's a lot of questions about Jesus now. Amen? Everybody, here we are in the beautiful climate of the South. I've been told if you go up north that you leave the Bible Belt. And it is a whole different world up north than it is what we have been accustomed to down south. We have our Christmas traditions. We are accustomed to those things. Things that we are familiar with. But yet it be not so everywhere you go. So with that being said, there's still a lot of questions today, even in 2021, about the authenticity of Jesus Christ and who Jesus really is. I don't know about you, but I've questioned that in my own life before. You say, well, you ought to know by now who Jesus is. I do. But I said there was time in my life when I too questioned this. All throughout the New Testament, Jesus was put on trial. You know, when I know and it's been said, he was a, he was a lunatic, liar, or a lord. The Lord. And I believe that's the same scenario that, that people are looking at today. I remember years ago someone said to me, Well, how do you know that there's not another way to God? How do you know there's not other religions of the world today that have the answers as well? I was asked that question. But Jesus himself answered all of those questions when he was here upon the earth. Primarily, we look into one in John 14 and 6, and you know that scripture very well. Where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Even Jesus himself, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one. In a lot of ways, I could get into that, but I won't get into that right now. But there were perfect unison between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost as there is today. When we pick up this scripture, it's a very odd place for me to start. But you'll understand why I went here a little bit later on. So tonight we're looking at Lord, Master, and Savior. Verse 46, the Bible says, Why call ye... Or why, and why call ye me, why well, hard to say in it, Lord, Lord, and do not things which I say. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built a house, digged deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood arose and the, the, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. I like that, don't you? Hallelujah, I like that. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently. And immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So when I was studying earlier today, I picked this scripture because it asked a question. For you and I this evening, again, we look at this. We look at this verse as it opens up in verse number 46. And he says, why call ye me Lord, Lord? When we look at this scripture, there's two things going on here. Basically, there's a man that built his house upon a Solid foundation, the rock of ages, if you will. And there are those that built not their house up on a solid foundation. They only had a form of godliness, if you will, but they were denying the power thereof. A 
Around our world today, there are many that will say Jesus is Lord, or Jesus Christ, or Jesus is this, or Jesus is that. There, was, there must have been a lot of talk about who Jesus was even in their day. Because they were saying, Lord, Lord. And Jesus even confronted this. But you do not do that that I tell you that you must do. He did that twice. And we see that where Jesus again, Jesus was teaching this. And when Jesus was teaching this, He was teaching His disciples. Primarily, He was challenging them for a surety and of a certainty of who Jesus is. Can I just sort of step away from my outline for a minute and simply say this? It is no day and no time for you and I to not know who Jesus is. We better know and our knower. Even when times begin to get worse, if you will, and if they do, and some prophesy they will, but I'm not into that tonight necessarily. But yet it don't make no difference if the, the conditions of the world stays as they are right now or the conditions of the world even get worse. It's very imperative to you and to me this evening to know who Jesus is. Again, Jesus was talking to His disciples. Those that would be the carriers of the gospel once Jesus ascended back to the Father. Again, when Jesus was teaching them, Jesus knew that their days in front of them were going to be more difficult than the days behind them. And again, I'm not saying anything bad or I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom by no means. But yet, in the same regard, if the days in front of us are worse than the days behind us, uh, there's one thing that we've got to know in our whole heart this evening. That Jesus has got to be the Lord of our life. When we begin to think about this, we begin to see that there is a difference uh, there is a difference between a life that can withstand a spiritual storm and one that cannot depend uh, or one that does not depend upon him as he goes through the storm. Christ again when we look at this we can see that Jesus again was making them to understand the general application of what they were saying. Jesus was saying to them again, He indicated this to them. I guess in my thinking when I was studying and thinking through this, it was provoking the disciples to ask themselves the question, Lord, You're Lord of my life? You're the Lord of my life? And in this we see that again that Jesus... Uh, was reminding them that it had to be more than just simple lip service in order for them to fulfill the commission that God was going to leave for that early church. Now, let's talk about the subject tonight. There's three things I want to talk about. I want to talk about Lord, I want to talk about Master, and I want to talk about Savior. We, and again, when we talk about Lord, the beginning of this, it, in a general term... The, 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 the title Lord is sort of like in the origin or the beginning of that, you would say, Mr. Green or Sir. In that day, it would be a, a greeting and they would, they would greet one that would say Lord. They would greet one that way that would be, be one that would lead to... Um, a defining definition or a defining factor here where that it was describing the individual of a person that would have power or a person having power or one that would have authority or it would be one who would be a master or owner. Yet, in the general application or a general ap application, the word salvation, it would mean... In, a, in a, broader, a broader significance, it would be used in a term that would mean owner. When we say Lord in the context, in the general context, if somebody was, say for an example, uh, an employer and had an employee, one that had authority over, they would address them as Lord. But yet, it goes a little bit further than that. 
in the New Testament when we think about the term Lord Jesus. Now, again, when you look into the Scripture, there are several places about this, and I thought that this was extremely, <clears throat> extremely interesting, the way that it uh, actually put this together as I was reading and studying this, because when you look into the Scripture, there, there was a title that was uh, significant that was made of, of, of Jesus Himself. And, and I'll get into that in just a minute. But we see that in the Scripture, and there's several different places that this is actually listed, and I'm just going to turn to a couple of them. When we look at this, we see that how that Thomas, when we see Thomas, uh, when Jesus Himself, He had the nail prints in His hand, we see this over in uh, John chapter 20. There's several verses of Scripture that I wanted to mention here, because this is where Thomas was there. Thomas, again, just to paraphrase this really, really quick, is when Thomas uh, was there, and he mentioned this in verse 24 and following about Jesus. He said, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not there when Jesus came. After the resurrection, Jesus came. Thomas was not there. Other disciples were there and said unto him, we have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. But he said unto him, watch what Thomas said. Thomas said, except I see his hands, the, the, uh, the prints in his nails, uh, and put my finger uh, into the print of his side, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, Thomas was just simply saying, I'm not going to believe this, but see now, again, I'm a little bit abstract in my thinking because of the way that I look at things. Maybe, maybe Thomas didn't want to take no mistakes and, or make no mistakes, and he wasn't going to call just any Tom, Dick, or Harry Lord in his own life. He wasn't going to do that. He wanted to see it for himself. Now again, when we think about Lord this evening, Christ assumed that title throughout the New Testament. Several different places in the New Testament. I'm not going to take the time to turn there. It was, it was signified that Jesus was, was, was given the title of Lord. Again, when we think about Lord, think about this. Think about one who has ownership of you. Think about one who has power over you. Think about one who has authority over you. Somebody said, well, I ain't answering to nobody. I'm not going to humble myself before nobody. Jesus told Peter there when they'd done a foot washing, he said, hey, except, except you, I, Jesus talking to Peter, wash your feet. He said, I, you won't have no part of me when we get into glory. And Peter there in John 13, he said, hey, just wash me all over then. And then Jesus gave us that example. And Jesus said, if I, being your Lord, know how to, let me paraphrase it, know how to humble myself and wash your feet, you ought to also wash one another's feet. Now all the men take your shoes off. We're going to have a good foot washing. I'm just messing with you. Somebody here years ago said, hey, I don't do feet. Sort of put the slow down on the foot washing thing, didn't it? But Jesus was giving them an example. And we do practice foot washing every now and then. It's been a while, but we still believe in that. I believe in it particularly. But here, here again, when we think about the, the word Lord, think about it in this context of where one having a th authority or one having power or one who is known as the master or the owner. Now, I'm going to talk to you about it. When you say that Jesus is your Lord... How many of you know the Bible says you're not your own? Hello? You are bought with a price. Now, I'm not trying to make a slave comparison. That's not what I'm doing. But He bought you. He gave His life for you. And we call Him Lord. That means we're loyal to Him because we've humbled ourselves and by our humbling ourselves before Him and accepting Him as our Lord, then we, we become in, in uh, subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, we, we are His and He is ours and, and we sub subject ourselves to Him. 
Thomas when he realized the significance of the presence of the Lord and the mortal wounds that was there and his body of this living man that was in front of him. Immediately, Thomas understood with a clarity, without any question, uh, that, that this was truly the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at this, we see this again, that Thomas there began to acknowledge Jesus' deity. Again, when you see that, we see this in the Word. Uh, and, and he says this, and he told, tells him here, again, when you look into the Word, he says, uh, wherever I got to right there, 25. And he says in verse 26, and he says, and, and, and after eight days again, his disciples uh, were within, and Thomas with them, and came to Jesus, and the doors being shut, and, and he stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Watch this. Then saith he to Thomas, Hey, Thomas, look here. Reach thither thy finger, and behold my hands, and, and reach thither, or hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas, when Thomas began to do those acts that Jesus told him to do, immediately there, there was something that, that, that shifted in the realm of the New Testament in particular, because this particular time when this word Lord only was addressed to Jesus throughout the New Testament, only by the disciples from that point on. It was not no longer just a general word. Again, the disciples acknowledged Him with this title, but there was no more usage of this word curios uh, was ever again used by, by the believers in addressing anybody else save God in the, uh, the New Testament. In other words, nowhere else did they say, uh, Lord, let me use this as an example, Lord Joe or Lord Bobby or Lord Jesse. That, that was no longer used anywhere else in the New Testament. Because it was then that these disciples understood that He is supreme and that He is deity. That there is something different about Jesus Christ. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to just get really real, real with this for a minute. But because I believe in our world today, in our world today, we have somehow missed uh, this in our society today. Even though we're 2,000 years removed from the cross, uh, I think we need a fresh revelation of Jesus. I believe we need a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. And I say, oh God, uh, let it start at Thomas Field Church of God. But Lord, let it start in me. I want to see Him in all of His glory. I I want to see him as I've never seen him before. Oh God, Thomas got a revelation of who Jesus is and who Jesus was. And I believe today if we can look at the, him as our Lord, that you too and I too can get a brand new revelation of him. And I'm saying God, give the church more than just saying, Lord, Lord, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not that which I tell you to do. You ask the, co the common person today, in a lot of places, are you saved? Are you born again? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. Yeah, we live in the South, we're Bible Belt. Oh yeah, you know, eat chicken on Sunday afternoon and sit on the porch and rock in chairs and have a good Southern time. Everybody's saved. You're saved, I'm saved. We're, we're one big happy family. But have you made him Lord? Are you with me? I don't have time to turn to it. I'm not going to turn to it. I thought about it as I was studying this. But over in John, and you don't need to turn there, Kathy. But over in John chapter 15, it's where Jesus was talking about, I am the vine and you're the branches. And he tells us to bring forth fruit, more fruit, much fruit, that your fruit shall remain. And he says that his father is the husbandman. He's the owner of the vineyard. He's the owner. That's good. Even on a Wednesday night in December. But He's your owner. You're not by yourself. He owns you. I have an owner. He knows how to take care of His sheep. You say, why are you going through everything you're going through? Why, why are we... Why? Let me tell you something. We live in a fallen world. From Genesis even to now, we are still under the curse of the fallen world that happened with Adam and Eve. It's still out there, folks. 
But I'm going to tell you something. Until we leave and until the rapture takes place, until we're glorified, hello? We're still going to deal with the, the, the facts of humanity. But I'm glad I don't have to deal with the facts of humanity alone. I have a Lord over my life today. Hallelujah. Again in Acts chapter number 2 and verse 36, we see this where Peter was talking there. Peter had given his great message of Pentecost and how that he began to tell them that, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter began to say there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter in his confrontation to the Jews at that time and those that was there that was questioning what happened at Pentecost and why these men were acting this way and why everything was going on at Pentecost, he went back and he told them, he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus. The same Jesus. Well, Christos, uh, Jesus anointed uh, uh, Savior, Jesus' is Savior in Christ is anointed one. He's an anointed Savior. I'm getting ahead of myself, ain't I? And he says, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Hold the pause button right there. We'll get back to that in a minute. When we think about this again, where we think about this, this term, the next term we look at, we look at not only Lord, but we look at the word Master. And I was thinking as I was writing some notes today that the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that we, we know these scriptures very, very well. And these, it's those scriptures that says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord, the Lord, confess Him with your mouth. Not my mouth, your mouth. Somebody says, well, preacher, pray the sinner's prayer for me. I can lead you in a sinner's prayer, but just saying the prayer by itself is not going to do anything for you. You've got to see this for yourself in the Word of God. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. You've got to confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth. Who is the Lord? Who is your Lord? Hello, somebody. He said, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Look at this. He says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But the emphasis here, again in verse number 13, says this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you make him your owner. Second thing, he becomes your master. I thought about the song that we sing, Jesus, Jesus, Master, Savior. Is he your master tonight? Hello? You know, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not those things that I tell you to do? Are you building your house on the solid foundation or are you building your house on the sinking sand? Those that have made him master are building your house on the rock. Now, I may see things different. I look through the eyes of humanity like you, but I hope that God has given me a heart of a pastor and I hope that that's been evident through the years. Sometimes, sometimes our flesh is weak. Sometimes our flesh is frail. Sometimes we act in ways that really does not exhibit a Christian walk or a Christian attitude or Christian behavior. When Jesus was telling them, why call ye me Lord, Lord, what he was really doing here was challenging them According to commentary, he was challenging them as to their behavior. Boy, that's challenging, isn't it? Does our behavior line up with our confession? Does our behavior line up with our behavior? Again, when you think about the word, uh, the word master, it was where that, that it was frequently rendered in the scripture master in all four different gospels we see again that the word christ is there christos again when you look at Christ, uh, christos it's anointed one but it was translated master in the uh, uh greek and uh, 
to Rabboni where Nicodemus in John 3 and 10, and I have to turn there because I didn't write down the scripture. But there in John 3 and 10, we see that where again, Jesus was talking to this young man, Nicodemus. You know the story of Nicodemus. But he says here in the word, he says, Jesus answered and said, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? In other words, when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he said that he came to him by night because... Uh, uh, he was uh, afeard, I guess, of people seeing him there because he too was a leader. Didn't want anybody uh, supposedly to see him there with Jesus. But yet we see here that Jesus Jesus and Nicodemus was having a conversation. And Nicodemus looked back at Jesus and said, I, We know that thou art a teacher sent from God. So when you look at the word teacher, teacher is a word that is translated also a word master. So let me say this, before he can become your Lord, you've got to have a master over your life. And the word master is understood to be with Nicodemus and Jesus as a teacher. Is he your teacher? The Bible says that when Jesus ascended, that, the, that he would send the Holy Ghost uh, and that he would lead us into all truth. Uh, and then he also told those disciples that the Holy Ghost would be their teacher. Don't even worry about it. Don't go and carry your script. Don't worry about it. Don't even worry about what you're going to say when you get into a tight spot. He said because the Holy Ghost, the teacher, is going to show up. People say, how in the world do you keep a good attitude? And how in the world do you keep going in the day and the hour that you're living in and we're living in? Because I have a Lord over my life. He is my master and He is my teacher. He's my teacher. Rabboni, He's our teacher. He's Christ. We Again, we see this word Christ. Is, and it's very important that we see this in the Scripture. Anointed one. So now we look at Him as Lord one who owns you, one who is over you, one who has authority over you, then we look at this term, when we look at master, when we look at here in the scripture, here in the master, that we have one who is our teacher. Again, this term was used, and then we look at the one who is, a scripture is, is, is here in uh, anointed one, when in the scripture, it's a long, it's a long section of scriptures, and you can actually turn there and read it sometime. I'm going to hit a high spot. But it's in Acts chapter number 8 because it was there when, when uh, uh, Philip was there with the uh, Ethiopian. He was a eunuch and we was there and we see this whole scripture set, if you will. Uh, it starts there about verse 26 and it goes all the way down through verse number 40. But the eunuch heard Philip as Philip was there, and he heard him talking about the scripture, where that it was talking about Jesus was led as a lamb before the slaughter, and he opened up his mouth, and that's over in Isaiah 53. This eunuch heard that, and then in verse 35, it says, Philip opened up his uh, mouth and began at the same scripture, watch this, and preached unto him Jesus. Jesus is what? Jesus is Yeshua, it's salvation, it means salvation. And then in verse 36, he says, And as they went on their way, they came by water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water, and doeth hinder me. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? Look at verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. If you believe with all of your heart, you can be baptized. And then he says, this is what he said. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What a powerful confession by that man. What a powerful confession to say that I believe not only is He Lord, but I confess that Jesus Christ is the master over my life. Is He your master? Have you made Him Lord? Owner? You belong to Him? But now you've made Him your master. Again, when we think about the word Christ, Again, when you look at this, he says that he had to confess Jesus. I know there are those today that may not believe that. There are those today that try to water it down, and there are those today that try to take the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ out of the equation. But the Bible reminds me, except that there's a shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no other way. Hebrews 11 talks about no 
other blood, not the blood of bulls, not the blood of turtle doves, not the blood of goats. Uh, no, any other way, there's, there's no other way to be saved except through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of religion in our world today. There's a lot of opinions in our world today. But can I just tell you, this is the way I live and this is the way I, the way I, I see it. When it comes to this, our opinions stop. Because this is the final authority way far more over your opinion or my opinion. Sometimes somebody confronts me with certain issues. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. There's some tough issues out there right now. I always say, well, go back and see what the Bible says about it. And base your answer upon what the Word of God says. Base your answer upon what thus saith the Lord. If He's your Lord, He's your Master, then He's going to be your teacher. Because, He says, confess that He is, uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So many, so many descriptions of Jesus here. Jesus, Christ, then He says the Son, and then He says of God. And I could get into every one of them. And then again, the Bible says that the, the chariot stood still and Philip went down and he, 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 he uh, uh, baptized the eunuch there. The next thing when we think about Lord, we think about ownership, we think about the Messiah. Then we think about Savior. We think about Him being our Savior. What is Savior? What is Savior? I know years ago we sang a song, not here at Thomasville, but in Monroe. It talked about the caravan that led to Bethlehem. And along that caravan leading to Bethlehem, I don't remember the name of the song, but we sang it and it, it talked about the, the Deliverer is coming. Savior. There's an anticipation in the air even for you and I this evening. In a lot of ways, we're anticipating Christmas. Oh, we got to get in high gear. And law no, we, we got a lot going on around here for the next few days. But, 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 but we think about Christmas. We think about this coming Savior. We think about this, the next coming few days. We think about the Advent. We think about everything that leads up to Jesus coming as a little babe in the manger. His name should he be Savior, Redeemer. The word Savior is Deliverer. I don't know about you, but I was in my sin. I was maybe not as deep in sin as others, but I was in sin enough to know that I was not right with God. Hello, somebody. Somebody said, well, I just told a little white lie. I didn't know there's a difference between a little black lie or a little white lie. Sin is sin, wrong is wrong, and right is right. I was in the wrong before Jesus redeemed me. Hello? I knew that I needed to be saved. I knew that I had not made Him Savior over my life. I knew that I had not made Him the one over my life that I needed to be delivered from my sins and from all of my transgressions. See, people today, they can talk about Lord. They can talk about Jesus. They can talk about Christ. They can talk about Master. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. We've got to know Him as Savior. Hello, somebody. When we think about Savior, we think about the one who comes to redeem who all lost humanity. We think about the one that built the bridge between heaven and the earth. We think about the one, even to this day, that's at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for you and I. Is that not awesome? Think about that. Let's, let's hit the pause button. Think about that. That right now, in heaven, we have a mediator. We have an advocate. An advocate is the lawyer. We have one that's pleading our case before the Father. We have a mediator. We have one that is standing in the gap between the wrath of God and the mercy of God. And the Father looks at us and the Father looks down and He sees the blood of His dear Son. And then He thinks about what it costs for you and I to be redeemed and the ransom. He paid the ransom. He paid that for you and He paid that for me. The Bible reminds us and the Scripture says that He's not willing any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. 
I wish the world today would come to repentance. I don't watch very little news. Don't have no desire. You say, well, you living in a fantasy land, you're just keeping your head in the sand. Some things I just choose not to participate in. I couldn't tell you, and somebody says, well, you need to know what's going on. You need to warn the church. You need to let people know that, prepare for days ahead. And you need to be the one telling people to, to, to get ready for days ahead, whatever those days may be. Can I tell you that if you go to the book of Revelation... And you begin to read through the book of Revelation. John saw him and he fell at his feet as dead. And he gives this description of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives this glorious description of, of the one that he saw. One person said, I'm not looking for an airplane ride. I'm looking for a plane air ride. It may be 20 more years before Jesus comes. It may be 10 years. It may not be in none of our lifetimes when Jesus comes. But it may be tonight. It may be tomorrow. So many people may say, well, I'll get right with God one of these days. How many of you have ever heard that? I'll get right with God one of these days. I, I got a few more things I want to do before I, I do that. Scripture reminded that poor rich man, didn't he? Lazarus comforted in the bosom of Abraham, but that poor rich man was being tormented in the flame. You say, there you go, preaching that hell message again, scaring people, into, scaring people to death, talking about hell. I tell you what, from my understanding, there's not but two places to go. And those that's not made him Savior are not going to go to heaven. You say, well, do you gloat in that? No, it's a saddening thing. It's a very saddening thing. Because God has done everything. You say, well, we're all saved here tonight. Well, hallelujah. But there might be somebody that's not. And there might be somebody online watching that's not. Hey, we get a lot of people. They don't always... I see people out in the public sometimes and they say, I've been listening to you online. I said, really? One in particular place, I go and pay a particular bill. And the lady that's there, and we're friends, and she says, I listened to you. The other night when I was sick and didn't preach last Sunday night, she said, what happened? You didn't have church. And I had to explain myself, you know. So we never know who's listening. We have no clue. When Miss Joanne up there hits that WWW and it goes worldwide, well, pow. We have no clue where it goes. You say, does that not scare you? No. It is what it is. I think it's just a platform that God's given the church today to preach the gospel around the world. And you know what? It's got an off button too. People don't want to listen to Alan Green. I ain't going to get offended. Hit the off button. Go find you somebody else. Hello, you say, my God, Pastor, you're getting pretty crude to not know. Everybody's not going to, one, one fit don't fit all. You know what I mean? But they're going to hear something tonight. They're going to hear the fact that they're not going to get into heaven except they know Jesus as Savior. But you've got to know Him as Savior. People might say, Lord. People may say all these other things I've talked about tonight. But we've got to know Him as Savior. Let me wrap it up. You're going to get out a minute or two early. We look at this in the Scripture and it says, before any of these others can take place, before He's Lord, before He's Master, before He's Teacher, before anything else, he asked that we make Him Lord. Savior, I mean. We asked, he asked that we make Him the Savior. When we look at the Scripture, back to the Christmas story. Hey, and, and by the way, you can get a concordance and you can study this and this message could go on and on and on. Plenty of Scripture there to look at. But I guess this is my favorite because it outlines what I feel like God did on behalf of man. Now I want you to think about this again. Think about the seriousness of this. That God 
loved you and me and he thought about the world as mixed up and tangled up and messed up as our old world's in, even back in the day. And I want to tell you something, friends. Sin is not a new thing. Some of you are a little bit older than me, and it was there when you were younger, just like it's there for our young people today. Somebody says, I don't know what in the world we're going to do with these young people today. I don't know what's wrong with them. I can tell you what's wrong with them. Sin. But as much as there is sin, there's also a Savior. I think of a song real quick before I close. I got a scripture or two to read. There's a, there's a song that we used to sing years ago and it says, I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with Him over and over and over and over again. I think it's something about every day is sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between the Lord and I. I keep falling in love with Him over and over. You've got to keep doing that, friend. Sherry's not in here to testify to this or to hear me say it. I wish she was. She's in the fellowship hall with the little girls. That's how I keep my love life fresh with my wife. I keep falling in love with her. Somebody says, I can't stand mine or my other one. You just need to figure that out on your own. Come on, somebody. Just fall in love with each other, but I find fall in love with Jesus. Now look here. When you look into the Scripture again in, in Luke chapter number 2, I love these Scriptures. In verse number 8, look at this. When you look at this, it says, and there, was, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were very afraid, sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Is that not awesome? That God... Allowed you and I to have enough sense. That's the only way I know how to say it. To understand the gospel message and to respond to the gospel message that we've made Him Savior, our, our, our Deliverer, that He's delivered me from sin, He's delivered me do you know I sinned all I wanted to today? I did. I sinned all I wanted to. But I didn't want to. I have no desire to sin. I have no desire to do anything wrong. I have no desire. You say, do you live a perfect life, preacher? No. Capital letters, uppercase, bold print, exclamation point five times. No. I don't live a perfect life, but I strive to. Hello? I strive to. Because I have a Savior. He's redeemed me. And I love Him tonight. I don't know if they've got music tonight lined up, anything, anywhere. But if not, we'll stand here in just a second. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Watch this. Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there were, was with them, with the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I'm glad I have a Savior tonight. I'm glad I've allowed Him to be my master. I'm glad I've given my life to Him that He can become my Lord. He, he owns me. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. Stand with me. I wonder this evening if 
You've all done that. I, I, this is a Wednesday night. It's a, it's a moment with the saints. I understand that. It's, it's, we're all saved here tonight. We're all happy. We're all, we're all on our way to heaven. We have no care if the trumpet was to sound right now and the rapture, there, everybody in this room would go, Phew. no worries, right? Only if you've made Him Savior of your life. You've been born again. You've been saved. You've given your heart to Jesus. He lives. He lives in your heart. You know that. Bow your heads with me tonight. Father, I love you tonight and I thank you for this thought, this message for the day, for the evening. And Father, I thank you, God, for the Word that corrects us and the Word that leads us and the Word that guides us. Father, I thank you, God, for the heart of these folks this evening, for every one of them that's here tonight that's heard the Word. Lord, I pray, O oh God, even now, that Father God, right now, that God, you drive this message into our heart. Drive it home, God. Let, let us not just have a form of godliness, but Lord, live for you. Let us make you Lord over our lives. And Father, I thank You. I give You all the praise, God. I give You all the glory and all the honor. Just bow your heads with me for a minute. And I just simply want to ask you this question. Before we leave here and before we leave this evening, I just simply want to ask everybody in this room, if you know without shadow of a doubt that you've made Jesus Lord of your life. I just want you to slip your hand up and I say, Pastor, He's my Lord. I've made Him Lord of my life. He's my Savior. I'm not even looking around. Just, this is your confession before heaven. I'm not looking myself. This is your confession before heaven. I've made you Savior. I've made you Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. If your hand's raised this evening, thank you. And God bless you. Put your hands down. If you're here in this room, and I'm not looking around either. And if you could not raise your hand, would you let Jesus come into your heart? Would you let Jesus come into your life? Don't take a chance on missing heaven. The debt is paid. The debt is paid. Jesus died for you. Amen? He gave His life for you. And now you can make Him Lord over your life. The owner. You can make Him Master. The teacher. And you can make Him Christ. The anointed one. But more than any, more than any of them. Savior. The deliverer. And that's been my heart. Today, as I have studied and as I have prepared for this message. And maybe it was for somebody here, maybe somebody online. I have no idea. Only thing I know is I delivered what God put in my heart. So now you've got to decide for yourself what you're going to do with it.